And if I ask you, uh, which of these two agents looks more lively, uh, human-like behavior, like uh, what a kid will do with a pole trying to balance, which one of the two will closer to, to human uh, behavior? The top of, or the bottom one? Well, the top one, I would say. Yeah, it looks a little bit more like, uh, yeah, like a kid trying to play around, right? With the, so we will go back to, to this in the future. So, so let me go to, uh, with the basic introduction because I don't know the real uh, uh, your, your background in, the, in details. So let's just start with the, with the basic notion of uh, rewards. So uh, when it comes to described behavior in uh, humans and in animals, the most common uh, hypothesis or, or assumption is that uh, we are a, what is called reward or utility maximizer. So this is the, the standard assumption across uh, many fields. Uh, including uh, economics uh, by von Neumann and the, the fathers of, uh, of mathematical economics, uh, Sutton and Barto, if you want to relate to reinforcement learning and neuroscience. Uh, but even in psychology, uh, this is pretty much the basic, uh, the basic assumption. Uh, which means that it's very important to answer the question of what rewards are. So this is a question for you guys. What do you think rewards are? Beijing, Beijing, you, you can also ask what if you want. So what is a reward? Yeah? Scalar to define goals of an organism. Okay. So this is color that defines some goals, okay. Any other notion of reward that you would like to introduce? Yeah? Like whatever the organism gains from the outcome of the behavior, so it could be a sense of pleasure or food. Okay, 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 very good. Okay, so we have like a, you know, it's a, a it, look, it looks a little bit multifaceted. So we have different uh, ways of uh, defining it. So this is uh, one standard way of uh, of uh, thinking of uh, rewards. So you have an agent that interacts with, uh, with the environment. The agent perceives the state of the world. Uh, and based on that, the state of the world generates some action that uh, uh, makes a change in the environment. So the, the state of the environment goes from ST to ST plus one, and the environment can respond with a reward at a later time, uh, delay time, R uh, T plus one. And this is also uh, observed by, by the agent. So uh, this uh, classical uh, picture of, uh, of uh, how reward signals are, are generated uh, it makes like a pretty um, um, artificial division between agents, uh, between agent and environment, right? Because uh, essentially uh, here in this picture, reward seems to just originate from the environment and not at all from the state of, uh, of the agent. But we know that this is not the, uh, the case. So, so uh, rewards can be external or internal. So uh, uh, animals may sought to, to look for sugar, for instance, to get some, uh, some energy, and this is like a, like a proper material that is outside in the wall, so it's really outside the, the, the agent. But uh, uh, decades of research in neuroscience has made clear that also there are internal signals that act pretty much like rewards, like dopamine. When you there is a release in dopamine, dopamine uh, in the, uh, by the substantia negra, uh, it acts pretty much like a reinforcement, uh, like, a, like a standard reward. Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. So, so why should I think of this as a reward and not as some mechanism that will allow me to get an external reward later? So why should I think of that itself as a reward? It, it's unclear. It's unclear. So uh, it's unclear. Uh, behaviorally, uh, animals uh, seek uh, sugar, but also experimentally, uh, it's, it's observed that uh, animals seek uh, dopamine release. But, I mean, this famous experiment where you have this uh, rat that is uh, pressing uh, and, and, uh, and holding a, a key uh, that releases uh, dopamine inside, so the animal is keeping uh, repeating again and again this, uh, this, this behavior. So let's leave this like a, a possibility that actually rewards is uh, like internal, uh, there is a, like internal component that is very important to it. But is there a definition of reward then? Or is I'm going to go to a tentative uh, definition of reward. So right now I just open up like a different uh, facets of, uh, of reward. It can be also extrinsic or intrinsic. So extrinsic uh, kind of rewards will be uh, something that you will get when your father is telling you to pass an exam. And you will get a reward because you make your father happy 
uh, uh, can be intrinsic if there is nothing uh, in the standard world that really can explain in an easy uh, way your behavior. Uh, there is a nice review by, uh, by, this, uh, by these two guys. Kind of block, right? Okay, it doesn't respond. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Are you trying to? Yeah. It was, it was just, uh, so this is a tentative uh, definition of uh, what rewards are. So let's consider uh, rewards as uh, policy independent action state uh, signals that are sought by uh, an agent. So whatever signal that we can define can be dopamine, can be external signal, whatever uh, signal that we can define could act as a reward if this signal is sought by the agent. Right, whatever signal it is. So it's, and a critical component here is that this comes in the form. And so it means that the agent wants to yeah. maximize it. Yeah, to wants to like maximize it. Uh, and we can define now like a, a, a specific objective that uh, will fulfill that. Uh, this. Yeah, and what is meant by action state signal? Whatever uh, neural signal or war signal uh, or whatever thing that you can measure, Whatever action that you can define, and whatever state that you can define, that is sought by the by the agent. <clears throat> this is the most general definition of uh, what rewards it. Uh, as you can see here, uh, rewards can be external or internal. So the state can be external, can be internal. Uh, it can be extrinsic or intrinsic. So let's give uh, one example. I think that the bottom part is a little bit uh, uh, off, but it's okay. So this is a vacuum uh, uh, cleaner robot. So, um, so here we have the rewards uh, signal. This is the rewards on a, a quantity that depends on the state and the action. Uh, the state can be, uh, for instance, the internal component, which is the battery energy. That's totally internal to, to the, to the soon all this. Uh, yeah, so there's a question. Um, yeah. Should all these four rewards be the same when entering the Bellman equation? If so, why should we categorize them? Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's the point. So the point is that the, in psychology, people have tried to uh, classify different type of rewards. Uh, and now what we're trying to do is to uh, put everything into a single conceptual framework that is going to be uh, valid for all the cases, okay? So battery, battery energy, this is the internal component, the internal state of the, of the agent. The location is like a physical state of, of the agent in the room, for instance. The task that is being detected, so this is the combination between external and internal sensor because the, 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 the agent has to be sensing uh, this uh, external component of the world. Uh, and the agent can uh, have, a, have a, a set of actions that can choose from a uh, move right, left, forward, back, and can collect or not uh, whatever is being sent uh, in front of it. Uh, uh, so we, we cannot see the bottom part. Uh, but the point of this, uh, of, uh, this reward is that it's independent on the policy. And what is missing over there is the definition of, of the policy, which is the probability is a function that tells you the probability of generating an action given that the agent is in a state uh, S, particular. So that defines the policy is a very important component and I'm, go I'm going to go back to this uh, quantity in the, in, in the future. But what is important is that the reward doesn't depend on the policy. That means that if, uh, if the animal is, uh, if the agent is learning, the policy is changing because the animal is improving uh, the, maxi the maximization of, uh, of task uh, collection, but the reward itself is not changing. So this is not a given. So this is an assumption of this uh, whole framework. It doesn't need to be the case because animals, as they learn, they could change uh, the signals that they are seeking uh, in that process. So here, the assumption is that these reward signals, uh, this reward quantity doesn't depend on the policy being uh, taken by the by them, okay? Um, okay, so we go back to the, to the standard hypothesis. 
animals seek this reward uh, and they will do everything to maximize the amount of reward collected uh, in the future from now to into the future. But it has been known for uh, several decades that many behaviors uh, seem to elude a simple description uh, in terms of uh, reward maximization. So there are different types of behavior, such as uh, exploration and uh, motivated behavior or curiosity that doesn't seem to fit really very well with the concept of maximizing uh, uh, reward. So for example, when you have a kid that is interacting with, uh, with the model, it's just playing. And uh, it's, it looks that in, in the process of this kid playing with uh, and interacting with the world, it, that behavior is very difficult to explain in terms of, uh, of reward maximization, right? Uh, unless you define like pleasure or dopamine, uh, but uh, at the first glance, it looks a little bit different. Uh, it, it's not very goal directed uh, uh, up here. Yeah. But those behaviors you can explain in terms of value maximization, not reward maximization. Right, right, right. So that's that's the that's the standard approach. So the standard approach is that uh, in practice, in reality, all these behaviors can be explained in terms of uh, of uh, trade offs that uh, you may have. So exploration doesn't come by itself; it comes with uh, with exploitation. So this is exploration exploitation dilemma, and here you have to decide. Uh, whether you want to uh, to come to this uh, to this lecture to explore new ideas and to learn new ideas at the cost of you not working in the paper that you have to work uh, right now, so that will be like explorative uh, behavior. As, as, exploitative behavior will be you leave this room, you go outside, you sit down outside, and then you start to type and write your paper. That's going to give you more a reward, more uh, a reward that is immediate in time. Uh, so you have this thread. So when you make these decisions and the, when you explore, uh, this behavior is typically understood as, well, you explore now to learn, and this is going to allow you to write a better paper in the future. So you're going to maximize the reward that you're going to get in the future. So uh, the so-called value, the expected value of, uh, of being in this particular state. And the same happens for this other behavior. So being motivated uh, allows you to, to learn new stuff. So you lose time learning, but at the end, then you can gain uh, rewards in the future. And curiosity is exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, so often we might have multiple rewards that are conflict with one another. Um, and so in those sorts of cases, what exactly would you try to maximize? So we're going to formalize this uh, little by little. Yeah, yeah. So you, you just want to see the Bellman equation right now. Okay, just give me just, uh, just uh, one minute. It's going to come really, very really quickly. Um, so well, this is this is this is the goal. Uh, so let's first um, uh, look at how people have been uh, studying uh, exploration as, as uh, exploitation behaviors in uh, in behaving uh, animals to see uh, the type of complexities that you may encounter in uh, in trying to describe uh, those behaviors in terms of basic uh, models uh, of reinforcement learning. So very nice example is by Beckett uh, Evid. So here we have uh, a monkey who is uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, three uh, uh, possible targets. So initially the animal is uh, looking at the, at the center and he has to choose one of the three uh, targets to, to get some reward. So, uh, so if uh, the animal chooses this one, there's going to be some probability as associated to this uh, cue uh, that the, the animal will get a reward or not. And the same for the other tire. So each tire has associated probability of delivering a rule. Okay, so it's a stochastic process. The, the catch of this is that the reward probability of each of these uh, targets uh, fluctuates over, uh, as a function of time. Okay, so the only way for the animal to know what is the what is the current probability of uh, a target to deliver a reward is to interact with that target and to get experience and see. Uh, what is the frequency of getting rewards uh, by clicking, by choosing that, that time, okay? Uh, so in that process, of course, you have the exploration exploitation dilemma, right? So if you know that one of the targets is very good, like this one blue at the beginning, you have interacted with it and you have gotten uh, with probability 0.9 rewards, so you get consistently rewards, then one type of behavior will be like exploitation. So you just stay there. As long as 90% of the trials, you get the reward, you stay there. That's exploitation. 
But uh, uh, from time to time, there are switches, there are reversals between the probabilities. And what happens is when you're interacting with the blue target, and, the, and when the probability goes down, because this is a stochastic process, uh, that, uh, who's, uh, uh, such that the probabilities look to it over time, then uh, just uh, the animal starts to sense that the probability is going down. And maybe he thinks, okay, now it's time to explore and to check out the other targets to see which one is the one with the highest. Uh, so alternating with these uh, uh, exploitation periods, there are exp uh, explorative uh, periods that are very short, as you can see. So this corresponds to periods in which uh, you switch back and forth very quickly between the between the targets to know which one is the the the, the good one. Okay, so so how people model these type of behaviors? So the standard approach is using a Riscola Wagner linear rule. Okay, just a few questions about the design because often this design is preferred to design where the properties are constant, right? And and. When the properties are constant, you also they also the, the, the agent doesn't go. Can you comment on why you pay attention to this design rather than one the design cover? What does it reveal that okay? So so um, so with the design that is constant, essentially uh, pretty much the behavior is going to collapse to exploitation. So whenever you learn that the for example if, if this were totally constant, so eventually you interact with the three target. If this is constant, it's going to be 0.9. So eventually the animal will stick to that, to that object. Although it's not completely true. So the, the actual behavior that animals are still from time to time, uh, is, but the, the fraction of those uh, trials is very, very small. So just for pa uh, practical purposes, to see the transition between expo uh, exploitation uh, periods and uh, uh, exploration uh, periods, you need what you're saying is you want to study some steady state because with constant you could do experiments with finite horizons for right example, and you really see uh, kind of different behaviors depending on the horizon on the properties and so that you don't see yeah you, you won't have enough data to really to to understand how the first switches between these two behaviors so this design is good because then uh, you have to, the animal is forced to, uh, to explore from time to time. In the design that you, def, you define, the animal is, doesn't need to explore at all at some, at, after a while, although it's going to explore. But uh, that's going to be very animal dependent. It's going to be really like, uh, it's very unconstrained experimental setup. It's going to depend a lot on the internal state of the, of the animal, what it's doing. To, uh, it's curious if that day is going to switch a lot. If it's not, uh, so this is just to con to constrain a little bit more the, the behavior of the of that. No? Okay. Okay, we're scholar Barnack uh, learning rule. So the idea is that the, the animal uh, holds an estimate of the probability of each of these uh, targets. And the way this uh, estimates evolve over time is by using the delta rule. So essentially, there is an uh, error signal that compares your current estimate of the probability with the, with the reward that you get, which is a one or zero. So if uh, your probability is very low and then you get a, a, a reward one, this uh, error signal is very high. And it's going to tell you, look, it looks that uh, your, your estimate of the probability is wrong, so you have to increase it by some amount, which is what this, this equation is saying, okay? So uh, this is a very standard way of uh, conceptualize uh, what is going on over, uh, over here in terms of estimating the, the probabilities. And now you have to have a model as to how the animals choose the, one of the three targets. And there are different models that you can, uh, you can use. The, the most basic uh, model is what's called uh, uh, epsilon greedy action selection rule. The idea is that uh, you will uh, compare, you will look at the three uh, estimated probabilities that you hold in your brain. And then with probability one minus epsilon uh, plus a small component, uh, you choose the one with the highest probability. So with a very high probability, this epsilon is typically very small, like 0.01. So that means with very high probability, you choose the, the, the target with the highest uh, value. But with some other small probability, epsilon, you divide, uh, you choose any of the other targets, okay? Uh, you can check that. The, so this is an, an exercise for you. You have to uh, find what is the mistake in this equation. Okay. Um, 
there are different rules that uh, you can use. Instead of this uh, uh, epsilon greedy action selection rule, you can use a softmax action selection rule, in which you are going to, of course, uh, choose with the highest probability the, the option with the highest uh, probability, uh, pro estimated probability. But you are going to grade also uh, uh, the, the probability of choosing the other the suboptimal targets according to their probability. This didn't happen in this, uh, in this case. So here, uh, any suboptimal uh, uh, target was chosen with the same probability. In this other case, uh, the target with the lowest estimated uh, uh, probability is going to be the one chosen the least, okay? And this uh, action selection rule has a lot of uh, uh, history. In psychology, it was introduced as a heuristic to explain uh, stochasticity in the behavior of, of animals, even in the conditions that you were describing, even in situations where the behavior should be totally determined. <laughs> still you need to introduce a little bit of noise to explain the behavior. There is no way to, to, uh, to work with deterministic models to describe behavior, even in uh, the conditions that you describe. So what is this N here? Equation. This N is the number of targets. So in this case, will be three. For this particular experiment, it will be three. Uh, so this is what they, they found. What they found is that the, uh, so this is the, the uh, histogram of uh, trials, the number of trials that are in, in between switches of transition between one state to uh, 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 to another uh, another sporadic state, and uh, and what you can see is that it looks this distribution looks bimodal, has like a peak here where there are uh, uh, between uh, with the, where uh, with very uh, within very few trials there are switches between targets, but then you have these very long periods that uh, go up to 15 or 20 trials where the animal is sticky, has a stuck uh, in uh, one particular object. Okay, so you can fit this uh, in, with two exponentials and you can see that the model with two exponentials is much better. And actually there is a big difference in, the, in terms of log likelihood in describing the data. So, so really this, this division is described by two exponents. So there are two time scales, one short time scale and another one long time scale that you can immediately assign to uh, uh, exploration periods and exploitation periods. Okay, so like kind of bimodal uh, behavior. Okay, so all these uh, models uh, account for uh, this experimental data. So this is this is what the epsilon greedy does, and this is what the soft map uh, does. Uh, so these are the, the uh, best fit uh, parameters for for both uh, models. And uh, what you can see is that actually, uh, so these are model results. So this is not the data. So you just generate the, the uh, uh, simulate the models, and you generate uh, these uh, these transitions, uh, the, the the histogram of trials between uh, switches. And you plot the histogram, and what you see is actually that described by two uh, exponentials, but the difference in log likelihood is very small. So the gain by uh, by uh, the gain by describing this model uh, based on two exponentials as compared with one is very small. So that means that yeah, it's two exponentials, but this tail is not very long. This tail is not is not very long. And actually, when you compare to the experimental data, so. When you compare to the experimental data, only uh, so the models, uh, 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 epsilon greedy and the softmat greedy, they cannot account for this very long heavy tail that shows up in the in the, in the behavior. Okay, so then they can out. Uh, you can see here. I mean, these behaviors are very complex. So you could you would like to uh, describe them with, with simple models, but they are there is always uh, specific conditions, uh, specific uh, uh, variables that are not really captured by the, by the, by the, by the So they introduced this uh, hidden state uh, of the model, where the idea is that actually there is an internal explorative state that is distinct from the exploitative states of the animal. So the idea is that the animal holds uh, kind of like two type of behaviors, exploration and exploitation, that uh, and there are transitions between between these uh, between these uh, these states, and when you fit this model into the data, then you can capture really very well these two uh, these bimodal distribution. Okay. Questions about the about the experiment? 
uh, some of the details. Is there any cost of switching? Because I guess with a big form of a cost of switching. Yes. Yeah, I'm not in, in, in this model, but that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, for instance, uh, so Jan Drukovich, some model uh, where uh, there is a cost of switching uh, uh, in a decision making task where the, where the agent controls the eye movements. And, the, and by uh, introducing this cost of switching, you can explain a variety of, uh, of behaviors that you cannot. If, uh, if you don't introduce that. It's true that if in these models, in these very basic models, you introduced uh, cost, you could a priori uh, be closer to the bimodal distribution. I don't know how close because I'm, that's a, right now like a critical question. It would be like uh, something interesting to, to check. Yeah. But not that at the same time that in the uh, exploitation periods, the frequency of uh, switching is really very fast. So it's, it's very unlikely that the, there is a substantial cost for, for switching in, in this particular case. I also consider that here switching just involves uh, moving the eyes to a different price, which is like um, energetically speaking is, is nothing. But you know, but in terms of cognitive load, it could be, uh, it could be something. Okay. So in, in this previous experiment, uh, the uh, agent, the monkey, interacted with what is called uh, arms, uh, uh, armed bandit uh, problem. So here, the agent chooses a target, uh, gets reward, but the agent doesn't change the state of the world, right? The, the probability, these probabilities are evolving over time independently. The agent doesn't change the state of the world. So this is a very strong limitation of armed bandit uh, models. Because uh, typically, when we interact with the world, we change the state of the world, even you know, either our, our location or the location of other objects around us. So, when you want to go into that uh, type of uh, models or uh, situations, then uh, one type of framework that is very uh, uh, is very handy is a Markov decision uh, process. So the idea is that uh, you are in a particular state <laughs> of key. And uh, you perform an action uh, A of T at that particular, uh, when you're in that state, that results in a transition to a new state ST plus one, and possibly the delivery of some reward at time uh, T uh, plus one. So now you are in this particular state ST plus one, you perform a new action that leads to a new state and so on, okay? So this picture obscures the fact that at every state, you have a multiple uh, choice uh, task. So essentially, you can choose one action out of many actions. And uh, the way we describe the, uh, the policy, the way we choose these actions is by a, a probability, a P, which is the probability of choosing action A when you start a state S of T. This is what is called the policy uh, in a market decision uh, uh, setting. And it's precisely just that probability, okay? So, when you perform action A, you end in a particular state ST plus one, but actually there is some stochasticity possibly of transitioning between this state to another state in the world. And this is described by, uh, by another probability uh, uh, quantity, this is the transition probability, which is a world model. So if, if you know that the, you have a good model of the world, then you uh, a priori can tell what is the probability of transitioning to a new state given that you were in a state ST and you perform uh, action AT. Okay, if you don't know this probability, uh, 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 this transition probability, you can learn it. And, uh, and finally, this uh, quantity, which is, uh, uh, is policy independent, as, uh, as uh, we described uh, before, uh, is the reward signal that can be stochastic, but for simplicity, we're going to, we're going to take it deterministic. So it's on a scalar quantity that is totally given by the state that you are and the action that you made in uh, that particular time, okay? And uh, this is the essential quantity that we're going to be talking uh, a lot in this uh, lecture, which is the value, uh, the state value function, which is, uh, which is a very interesting object. So this is, uh, I'm going to unpack it uh, uh, in, in the, by doing some math. Uh, so the idea is that for every state, yes, 
And following a particular any policy uh, pie, you can define how good is that state, uh, how good is to be uh, in that state. Uh, this is going to be defined as the expectation of the future discounted cumulative reward that you expect to find uh, when you start at the state S and you follow policy P uh, pi. Okay. Uh, so this is the state value function under this policy. And it tells essentially is going to make a ranking of which states are good and what other states are bad. Okay, because if you are in a state with a very high value, that means that by following this policy, you're going to get in the future a lot of reward. If you are in a state with a very low uh, value, then in the future, you're going to get very little reward. So that's not going to be a good state for you. Okay, and the idea is that you are going to be looking for a state with a high uh, value. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to, uh, to my tablet to do a little bit of math. Sorry, just to very To your question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, all the stochasticity given by the, the world is in the RT plus one. Okay. And all the stochasticity is included in the RT plus one. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm going to, yeah, I mean, the point here is that understanding this, uh, this equation takes some time. And um, by understanding it, you can relate to the Bellman equation directly. So I'm going to do all these steps uh, for you. Okay. That was the question. So what does it mean exactly this? No, yeah, and my question was, where is the stochasticity by the part that- Yeah, the R's are random variables. Okay. They are random variables. Because the, pol the policy is possibly like a random policy. So you start from a particular state, and then you have a policy, and the policy is going to make you traverse a certain specific path in action in action uh, state, uh, state uh, space. Okay. Okay, are you ready for some mass? <laughs> okay, so uh, so the, the relevant object here is the is the state value function. So is this expectation that uh, we are going to to unpack it? Okay. So let me know if there is anything unclear with uh, with my writing. Okay, it's big enough so far. Is good? Okay. Okay, so, so the idea is that you start a particular state S, and by following a policy a pi, you perform, a, you make a path. And so you visit a different states and perform different actions as a function of time, okay? And we're going to call this path a, a tau. And the path is, a, it, it has initial condition, it tells you what is the action that you perform at that initial uh, condition. It tells you what is the, the next state that you visit as one. When you are in a state as one, you perform a new action and so on. Okay, so a path is described by this uh, collection of uh, actions and states as a function of time, okay? And, uh, a very important quantity here is the, the probability of the path. This is essential because when we want to compute the expected value of this, uh, of this uh, sum of random variables, this expected value is going to be expectation over the paths, over all possible paths that you may have. So you need to know what is this uh, probability of, of the path. So given the, the Markov uh, uh, decision process uh, approach uh, assumption, the Markov uh, assumption, the, this probability that we can make it uh, to depend on the initial condition, so this is a path starting at a specific uh, initial condition. So this is the, the probability of, uh, of performing action A0, given uh, that you are in state A0. So here we are assuming that the agent is following a specific policy pi, right? 
So this pi is something that is fixed. So this is something, this is the policy that the agent is following uh, while interacting with this, uh, with this environment. So this uh, probability multiply by the, by the transition probability. Now you're in a state S1. In a state S1, you can perform a new action with probability P I uh, uh, A1, given that you're in a state S1. Then that leads a new transition to a state S2, and so on. So this probability is the product of many terms uh, that are totally dependent on the policy and on the transition probability of the world, the state transition probability of the world. There is nothing else that uh, comes here. Okay, so now we understand uh, what does it mean, this, uh, this expected value. So this expected value is a sum where all the paths that you can, uh, that you can take starting at uh, S0. So this path essentially is going to be a sum over all possible A0s, S1, A1s, Sns, Ans, up to the future. So it's like it's a very complicated sum, multidimensional sum. Uh, of the probabilities of those uh, of each of those uh, paths, given that you are in uh, in the state as uh, zero, and now the random variables become a specific quantities that depend on the state and action that you are performing along the path. Okay, so these random variables that are over here, they're going to become here when we do the expectation a specific numbers that depend on the current uh, state and action that is made, uh, being made at time t plus one, at every time, okay? So at, uh, at time uh, one, so here, this will be like uh, time one, at time one, what the, what the agent gets is a reward R that depends on, uh, on S zero and the action that is being made. S0 and A0. The next term in this sum is going to be a gamma. Uh, it's, it's going to be weighted way by this gamma that it didn't show up. Sorry, I forgot about the defining gamma because it didn't show up at the bottom of the, of the slide. So this is the discount factor and it is typically a number below one. So that a future rewards are less important than rewards that are closer in time. Okay. So when you are in a state, uh, in a state two, uh, time two, sorry, then you get the reward S1, uh, R, uh, S1, A1, and so on. And you go up to the future, okay? So this expectation is uh, a priori, this very complicated uh, sum, multidimensional sum. The cool thing about this sum is, can be, is that it can be made recursive in the following way. So we can split this sum by, uh, by taking the first part, so we can say, okay, so this is the sun over tau over all the paths of the first piece, this piece over here, plus everything else. So this is going to be now everything else that we have over here. Okay, you didn't, you didn't pick up this uh, typo. Okay, so you have, uh, so the only thing that they did is to take out one gamma out, uh, and we have this sun over here. Sum over tau. It's a priori the same. It's, it's sums over trajectories starting on the same initial condition. But now we're going to be able to perform different sums. So in the first, uh, and I think that this is what you, you mean. So this, this quantity over here is actually a sum over a zero, S1, A1, S2 of this uh, complicated uh, uh, probability, right? So this is the probability that uh, we wrote over here. We can just plug it uh, over there. And what you realize is that uh, because this sun is only hitting a scalar that depends on, uh, on A0, so this is A0, we can sum up 
uh, the components of the path that are beyond uh, the first step. And all these sums, so if we perform the sum over S1, A1 and S2, they're going to give, they're going to give uh, ones. So these sums, they're going to give uh, ones. And essentially, when you perform this sum, the only thing that remains is this quantity over here, the sum over A0 alone. Okay, because the, the future components of the path doesn't, uh, they, just, they just sum out and it doesn't hit uh, this, uh, this reward that happens at the first, at the first step. Okay, questions about, about this? So this very complicated sum for the first time uh, simplifies quite a lot. And this is just what we mean by the expected uh, reward uh, following a policy pi, the immediate expected reward, uh, following a, a policy pi and starting at the state uh, S. So we are going to use this terminology for this first term, which is another expectation. But it's very important that you know what these things mean in, uh, in practice. So that means that you will make the, the sum over all possible actions, immediate actions, uh, and take the expectation of that by following that uh, particular policy. OK, and now let's go to the second uh, component over here, which is quite interesting. So this is, again, uh, the sum over A0, uh, S1. We're going to split it in this way. So we have A0, A0, P, S1, S0, S1, S1, and then we have everything else. We have uh, the sum over A1, A, S, um, S2, a true, et cetera, of the remaining probabilities. Okay, so this sum is, uh, is this uh, double sum that you, ha you have over here. And uh, what you can see is that uh, when this part of the sum is hitting, is hitting this part, so essentially, essentially this sum involves sums over uh, A zeros and S ones, that they don't show up over here, okay? So, but the sums over A1, S2, S2, A2, and so on, actually they're hitting this quantity. So you cannot just uh, sum, and, uh, sum them up to one. So you have to sum them up, weighted by this, uh, by this reward, okay? And actually you can see that this sum, so this sum apply over here, is precisely the value function so this is precisely the value function at time, uh, uh, when you start from a state S1. So here, the sum corresponds now to paths, to paths that start at S1. So here you have a sum over paths that start at S1. And because this sum is now hitting essentially the same quantity as, uh, as when uh, initially when we define the value of a particular state, this corresponds, this sum over here, corresponds to the value function at that future state S1. Okay, is this clear? And putting everything together, so this is the expectation of, um, over the future state of the next state S prime, given that you perform, uh, you follow a policy pi and you st uh, start uh, from a state uh, S1, the expected value of the, of the next step um, value function, okay? So to summarize, we can put uh, everything together. So this is a lot of notation, but it's important to specify the expectations of what and uh, what are the quantities that we are taking expectations uh, from. And this uh, equation is very famous and it has a name, it's called the Bellman equation. So this is the so-called Bellman equation. And it's a recursive equation because it relates the value at a particular state at some time with the future states that you may encounter as you perform one transition forward. 
in time. And the only difference is that there is some immediate reward that you may encounter in the first step. Okay. I think I, I will continue uh, 10 more minutes to finish up the math rather than taking the break now. I think it's okay because otherwise I will need to go back to the tablet and it's okay. Okay, so this is the, the Bellman equation. So what, what do we do with the Bellman equation? Uh, well, what we do with the Bellman equation is to try to solve it. Okay, so let's assume that we start from one state uh, S, we can perform a bunch of different actions and we end being in a different state uh, as prime. So these are different states that we can uh, uh, we we will uh, end in if we take a specific actions A in each of these uh, branches, okay? So let's assume that you want to compute the, the value function following a policy pi at this particular state. So you want to know how good is that state if you follow a particular policy. And let's assume that you know the optimal uh, uh, value function when you are in the next state, in the next state S prime. Let's assume that you know this. So that will mean, uh, so the optimal value, it will be like the, the one that is attained by the optimal policy. So the best policy that you can choose starting from S prime, let's assume that you know which one is that one, okay? Then how do you compute the, the optimal value at a particular at that uh, previous state uh, S? Well, very easy. So you go, so the optimal uh, value at that state is going to be the maximum over all possible actions of the immediate rewards that I will get by performing action A, plus the future discounted value that I will get after visiting the next state, uh, the next state as prime. So this will be the expectation over over the optimal future uh, values in the next uh, in the next step. Okay, so this is a new equation that is even more famous than the previous one because this is called the optimality optimality Bellman equation. This is the optimality Bellman equation, and if you solve this equation then you will know precisely what is, the, uh, what is the, the value of each of the states in the world. And then automatically that means that you know what is the optimal policy because the optimal policy will be going, taking the action that maximizes this quantity at every state. So you will know how to compute what is the best action. So essentially you will, need, you will like to go to future states that are very good. The best, the, the, the better, the best, but the better. Uh, this equation is also important because it actually uh, inspires a way to solve this equation. So this equation is very hard to solve a priori because it's a highly nonlinear equation, you know, the max operator. So whenever you have a max operator, you pretty much you should be very scared because, uh, because it's nonlinear, highly nonlinear. So it's the worst case scenario, possibly. Uh, but this equation, this recursive equation, uh, leads to a very easy algorithm to solve the, uh, at least to get an approximation to the optimal value function. And the idea is, is going back to this, uh, to this schematic again. Uh, so let's assume that you start a particular state S and initially your guess is that, you know, the world is very boring and all the states are, they have zero value. So my world is, so this is initial guess that may be wrong, but sometimes can be good saying, look, I think that the wall is, there is nothing there. It's like uh, whatever action, whatever policy I'm going to make, uh, the value is going to be always zero. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a starting guess. And let's assume for simplicity that the rewards are positive. In your wall, rewards are positive. Unbounded. So this equation has solutions whenever rewards are bounded. I mean, they're not infinite. I mean, it would be, it would be crazy if you have a wall with infinite rewards, right? So, so very natural uh, condition. So, so you start with this, uh, with this uh, value. Yeah. Ah, it's not showing up, sorry, yeah, thank you. Yeah. No? Yeah, so thank you. 
Uh, okay, so you start with this state S, and you want to uh, find a new estimate of the value at the, uh, the next iteration. So we would like to iterate uh, this value function uh, repeatedly up, up to until we get a very good approximation. So we start with some guess. This is very bad, of course, is uh, is zero. Uh, so how do we update this uh, uh, this value? So so if you are at the state S, uh, let's assume that you can take different actions, and you end being in a different state uh, as uh, zero. So if you are in this state, then what you believe, what the way you should update the value is by saying, okay. Uh, if I'm in this state, I may get a reward. And I know what kind of reward I will get if, uh, if I perform action A. So this is, uh, this is assumed to be known by the, by the agent, uh, what the, this reward function is. And, uh, you know, given my, uh, my current uh, belief about the value of the world, I, know, I believe that uh, when I go to a state A0, I will get uh, a reward zero. Okay, so, so essentially, here, essentially, what you're using is the, the expected value of the previous estimates of the your previous guess of the, of the value, which is zero. So your first guess, so your initial guess is that it's zero. Your uh, next guess is that the, the reward, the value is the immediate reward. That's a better guess, right? The, the immediate reward is like a one guess. You don't, you don't look at beyond the first step. So, but this is the guess. So now you can iterate this algorithm. So you can say, uh, now I'm going in, in the next step. And again, I'm going to estimate my value function by taking the max over, over all the actions. But now I'm going to take into account, you know, the, the possibility that I am being in a new state as prime, and I can use the all estimate that I have for that state. Rather than using zero, as I did before, now I use this estimate over here. Okay? I use this estimate. And that's going to give me a new, a new estimate of the value function. And we can iterate this. So we can iterate this. We can iterate this. And this is another famous uh, equation. Which is called the value, value iteration algorithm. And it converges. Yeah. It's it that was my question. Does it always converge? And it converges. And I'm going to give you the intuition. Why it should converge in this case? So this is the iteration number. So just start at time, uh, time zero. So and here I'm going to plot uh, v or, uh, the value of the particular state uh, iteration t. So initially we said that we start uh, our guess is zero. Okay, our guess is zero. In the first iteration, because rewards are positive, there is going to be an increase of the value. In the second iteration, because again, we are taking a max of positive numbers, it can, only, it can only increase. And it can only increase as you iterate this algorithm. But the cool thing is that because the value function is a weighted sum of, uh, of, uh, of uh, random variables, all of them are bounded, and it's a geometric series, this quantity has to be finite. It cannot go up to infinity. So essentially, eventually, this algorithm is going to convert. We're going to get to, to, to a value that is going to be really very close to the optimal. You will never, uh, actually, if, if, the, if the system is finite, you will convert in a finite number of states. Uh, but that can take quite a long, a long time. But eventually, you will get, anyways, at least really very close to, to the optimal. Okay, so this is an intuition why this value iteration algorithm works in the case of positive rewards. Actually, it can be shown that also works for negative rewards. So, it's, so with this, I think it's a perfect time to, to, to make the break. And then I continue with the slides. Okay. I'm gonna take uh, slide. Just before we go to the slides for you, but uh, and I wanted to solve it today with you, but uh, I don't think that we will have much time. 
but you should solve it and you should show me the solution uh, later on at some point during the conference, okay? Just to know whether you are able to, uh, to use the concept. So the idea here is that you have a, so it's a very simple problem where the, you have pretty much like a three year structure. You want to know, you want to estimate the value of these, uh, of all the states over here. And here you can perform either uh, one of these two actions and then you get reward uh, minus one uh, third uh, on the top, uh, minus one half on the top. And from here you have uh, stochastic transitions to these uh, new states with probably one half. And then you get these rewards. And finally you get a terminal step where you uh, just stay there forever and you get the rewards here. So you have to compute the value of all the states as a function of gamma. And tell me what, uh, what is the optimal uh, action as a function of gamma. Okay, so this is an exercise for, for you guys. Okay, so, so this is, uh, I mean, uh, all these algorithms are based on, uh, on uh, uh, optimization equations like, uh, like uh, the, of this short, uh, where, you know, if you know perfectly well the, the optimal value function, then taking the max uh, comes at no risk. You just take the max and uh, choose the, the, best, uh, the best action. Here I have introduced this notation. So this is, this is what they are called the, the Q values. The Q values are essentially for every action, you have the sum of these two quantities. So this is the Q value for a specific action uh, that you made. So, but in practice, when you are learning, in the process of learning, or when you are doing approximations uh, by uh, 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 deep networks of your value function, then the problem that you have is that you can never uh, know perfectly well the optimal value function. So essentially you're going to have some errors in your estimates. So these are your estimates and these are your errors. And uh, even in the best condition where these errors are independent and, uh, and uh, Gaussian and so on, even in that condition, you have a huge problem, which is that you're taking a max over noisy uh, estimates. And essentially, the, your next estimate of their value function is going to be over an overestimation of the true value function. Because essentially, you're going to be picking up here whatever outlier, whatever noise uh, component is very high. Okay, and this is, this is a real problem uh, in practice in the, of these uh, algorithms during the process of learning or during the process of approximating the value function with uh, deep networks. So the solution to, to this problem, uh, there are several heuristic solutions, uh, is always adding some type of noise. That's the, that, that's the way to go. I mean, uh, taking the max is too risky because then you're going to be too overconfident. Uh, you're going to be picking up uh, all layers essentially. So why not adding a little bit of noise? And the question is, how do you uh, regularize uh, this, the problem? What is the best type of noise to uh, smooth out the problem so that you don't have this, uh, this very big construct. So, uh, oh, sorry, so if, if there's no, if we know that there is noise that we can, why not cal instead of evaluate a maximum value function, evaluate a posterior for the value function? Yeah, that would be the way to, to go, uh, but that noise is very difficult to, to compute. Just that, they can be correlated. Uh, it's, it's going to be really very hard, uh, difficult object to, to, to work with. It's correlated noise. So you will have all the problems of uh, multidimensionality. You will need to make approximations of that. Uh, so people, I mean, here there is one expert on, on this, and maybe he, he can say something about on this. But uh, people have been dealing this problem with uh, some heuristics, which is adding some noise, and then seeing of these uh, things uh, compared to the to the approach without the uh, with so the one uh, possible way is to add uh, uh, epsilon greedy noise essentially for every suboptimal uh, estimated uh, action then you choose them with some uh, small probability just in case those are the, the good ones and then you go on and if you do this I mean this is guaranteed to convert so there is there is no no, no problem. But the question is whether this is the, the most uh, relevant type of noise. Uh, so people have been using a different uh, framework, which is added, adding a, uh, a, a component to the reward, to the immediate reward that uh, acts as a regularization to, to, to the problem. So 
So in here, what you have is that the, in, in addition to the immediate reward that you will get in one step, you add this component, which is uh, minus alpha of the logarithm of the policy. Okay, so this is not a reward in the sense of uh, of policy independent rewards as we talked uh, uh, before, right? But you can think of of this as, like, as now like a new intrinsic reward, total reward that the agent is feeling, and it has interesting uh, features. The first feature, of, of course, is that the the the, 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 the goals are still are still here, so then the agent is sick, is trying to, to maximize this reward, but balancing out with uh, being too deterministic. So if your policy is too deterministic, then uh, 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 um, actions that they have very low probability, they are going to give you a, like a huge, uh, like a huge um, uh, reward essentially. Okay, so you want to, um, so you want to have uh, to, to, to have many actions with very little probability. And that gives you like an intrinsic motivation. So you, you want to have as much uh, stochasticity as possible in this system. So to see this uh, better, you can take the expectation over A of uh, the minus logarithm, and this is the, the entropy. So essentially, you have a, a, a regularizer, which is the entropy. So, so you want to maximize reward, but at the same time, you want to maximize the, the entropy of the actions that you perform at every step. Okay. So this is a way to introduce uh, noise into, into your problem. Um, we don't see this one. And this one over here, uh, over here. So this is, this is just to say that this amounts to defining a new objective, a new value function that contains the, the initial rewards, the plus uh, these terms that not only speak about the stochasticity of your policy at the immediate step, but also in the future. So essentially, you also would like to have a, a policies that are going to be stochastic in the future, and that's going to be important for you. And then you will trade off a immediate reward or immediate stochasticity with future stochasticity. So in the same way that you trade off immediate rewards with future rewards. So you have all these elements in this uh, in this uh, frame, and it's called soft RL or entropy regularized RL because uh, uh, you will see because of the of the shape of the of the optimal policies that you that you get there. But this soft in, in, because it's a regularization. Okay, so there are two, uh, two main flavors to this. One is the popular uh, solve RL, where you have uh, this uh, minus uh, logarithm uh, term. And then you have uh, uh, a KL uh, RL, which is a version that is almost identical to the previous one, but you have a default policy, P, uh, P0. So what is the, the, the role of this default policy? So uh, when you so notice the difference. So this is the minus log, this is the minus log P divided by P0. That's the only difference. So when you perform the expectation, what you have over here is the KL divergence between the, between the two policies. So with this uh, regularization, what you have is that you want to maximize uh, rewards, but at the same time, you don't want to use policies that are too far from the default policy. So you have a default policy, like easy policy that you can implement in your robot or something like that. So the optimal policy, the policy that the, that the you want to use, shouldn't be too far from the from the default policy. So, for instance, if, uh, if you look at it here, if your default policy says that you cannot take action A at a particular state S, so the probability of that action is zero, then you shouldn't ever take in your in your actual policy that action because the cost is going to be infinite, because you are departing too much from the default policy that provides uh, that action. Okay, do you see this? Um, so why, why you would like to do something like this? I mean, this looks like a, like a good enough uh, approach, uh, but actually this leads to another set of algorithms where you can iterate uh, the default policy with the policy that you're uh, calculating at every, every step. 
and this is going to teach you to convert as well, and it has some sort of interesting uh, uh, properties. But when it comes to, uh, to describe uh, natural behavior, it's a very interesting idea, which is uh, championed by Alfonso Renard, uh, still on Pauli's uh, work, where he thinks that uh, the, the default policy uh, corresponds to habitual behavior. So habits that you have that are kind of built in into your brain and you perform uh, uh, on a daily basis. And the learning is acting against those habits, those habits, those uh, default policies. And because those default policies are kind of uh, built into your system, it's very difficult to add against uh, those. And this is uh, um, uh, conceptualized in terms of the chaos. So you don't want to depart too much to your habits to solve a problem okay? if, you, if you don't need to. And that will be better for, for the task. Okay, uh, um, questions so far? Are you also learning the default policy? Is static. Mm, well, that different person. So in the classical total of approach, yeah, is there is a default policy. But as, as I said, you can uh, you can take the default policy as the previous uh, the previously learned uh, policy. So essentially, you iterate the policy in there, and it essentially uh, this is a way to not to depart too much from the previous policy that you have run. There are many versions of uh, of this. Uh, so I'm afraid that I'm going to do a little bit more of more math, unless you have questions. Yeah. So either way, please. Uh, so the default policy, if you, in the last one, the second version, if you take that as random action, would that be equivalent to the first one? First version? Almost, almost identical, but not quite. Because, because if you have uh, like a uniform uh, default policy, right? A uniform default policy. Uh, it will be identical to the above if at, on every state you have the same number of actions. But if you have different states with different number of actions, then that plays a role. And actually that uh, will penalize uh, states with many actions, which is not very intuitive why you should do that uh, in practice. Thank you. It's a very good question, thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so, could you explain again when the our first sort of uh, first sort of version of soft RL why you're adding this entropy term to it? Because it seems like that's increasing the the value. You're not. I guess it's not like immediately clear to me where finalization. It's better to look at the the uh, the, the actual expectation. The actual expect the expectation is the entropy of the actions. So that means that uh, yeah, you want to go to states where you get this uh, reward, this is what you are seeking, but you want to go to a stage where you have many actions. Where, sorry, where, where, the, where the entropy of your actions is, is very high. And then you have to trade off these two things. So this is going to be controlled by this regularization parameter alpha. So if alpha is zero, then we go back to, to hard uh, RL. If alpha is non-zero or it's positive, you have a soft RL. And there is a trade-off now. Uh, eventually, in these uh, frameworks where you iterate the the, the policy, uh, this alpha goes to goes to zero. Can be made true to go to zero, so that you will convert to a solution to the original problem with a specific reward function. But the, when you want to describe natural behavior, it's not even clear why you would like to to neglect this term, because this term may play a very important role for exploration for uh, learning, for generating variability that we see that is essential ingredient uh, to explain behavior. So I would like to take this opportunity to think about this kind as, as opportunity to, uh, to model new ways of uh, behavior, uh, natural behavior. So that's sort of like an exploration term. Sorry? So it's sort of like an exploration term where like- It's exploration, it's exploration term. term. Yeah, term. it's exploration term. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it has many interpretations. Operation term, regularization term, depending on the field, you see it in a big, with different eyes, so so to speak, right? Um, so I would like to take this like with new eyes, like uh, like uh, with a new perspective of uh, of uh, of how to describe animal behavior. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There were more questions. I think that you, you should skip it. So I move with the students first. Unless you tell me that I should stop or something like that. <laughs>
Uh, um, so quality is, is there like a difference between the best policy under soft RL and soft max, or are they kind of similar? Uh, in what the best to? policy, uh, they are different. The best policies are different in, in the two cases. Is there, is there like qualitatively like a, a way to see like like a, like a, a quality of difference or, is it, or just a quantity of difference in the optimal policy? It's a qualitatively, uh, qualitatively different. So, I, so I there's know, another questions in, in the chat room uh, oh, from Beijing those. from Beijing can we understand the cost as the energy we need to transform from one state to the other uh, there is no notion of energy so far um, well actually yes so so you can embed that energy into the into uh, you don't see this sorry you um, you can embed the that cause in this reward function. So whatever trans actually you can generalize this reward function to make it depend on S prime as well. I didn't do it just to simplify the math, but you, you can make this reward function to depend on S, A, and S prime with no change in the math, so to speak. And then you have, you can incorporate over there the cost of state S to a state S prime given that you perform action A with all flexibility. And I think that there are, but I didn't respond to your question first, sorry, just to, if I remember well, you know, so they are qualitatively different. So hold on, in, in the next lecture, I will talk more about that, okay? Is it the case that this framework and including the entropy as a regularizer requires that the actions be defined in the Markov decision process in a, a sensible way. Like if you added a whole bunch of vital actions to certain states, don't really have any effect. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good and question. I like to handle that gracefully, just yeah, that, vital actions, but this one would change. Uh, so you mean, like, uh, so this is the question, how do we define actions? Uh, I'm just asking whether there's an important conceptual difference between the entropic approach and the classical approach in that we do have to think about finding actions in a sensible way, whereas a classical approach, you find the actions in a silly way and include a bunch of silly actions that don't do anything. The algorithms we're talking about, or what you were talking about earlier, would handle that gracefully. You can just converge on the policy. That would I think that you will have the same problems in the two frames. I mean, like uh, you can define un unnecessary actions in the hard RL or. You uh, it's the, the same kind of problems. Uh, so he, here, uh, you, if you introduce the generality of the action, so you can say, okay, I define actions as being, uh, yeah, like uh, uh, entities that they, they do the exactly the same on the state. So you can you can multiply the number of actions with no change in the observed behavior if you want, right? If you code the degeneracy into the system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Genetic, you would be... I think that you're talking about that, right? Sorry? You're talking about that, the degeneracy, right? I guess I that's one way of talking about it, I guess. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. There were more questions, or maybe not? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a bit confused about the, the motivation. So the motivation here is uh, to be able to better explain the behavior no, 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 no. So, so far, it's like a survey of what people does to uh, to regularize um, uh, problems. Where uh, if you don't add noise, then learning is slower, more sloppy, it uh, converges slow. And then I'm introducing a little bit of pieces to tell you that in my next lecture, I'm going to take this as a starting point to to talk about behavior. Yeah. But right now, I'm not exploring this in depth at all. So. Whatever question that you ask me about that right now, I think it's going to be like a big detour. Uh, unless you have a specific question. You know? no, <laughs> we started by saying the problem with the noise and the estimation of the value, but now we're defining a different objective function. So like you're talking about the, the different uh, steady state which you converge. So are we talking about the learning process? Are we talking about the steady state? Are we talking about... So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so for instance, I mean, like, what people will do is to take this. So this helps learning, but eventually this alpha goes to zero. Then eventually you converge to the original problem. That's it. You solve the original problem. 
like uh, from a machine learning point of view. You have the problem and then you solve it. And you introduce these terms as a way to speed up learning okay. and to avoid traps in the, in the learning. That's one thing. And the same happened with this one. You can do the same by uh, changing the default policy iteratively. So this is, you're talking about an intelligent way of incorporating exploration into the process. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's one way to look at it. Yeah. So I have two questions. Don't worry about time because we can okay. uh, eat a bit on the discussion. So, so um, the, the two questions, the first is a bit of a technicality, which is if A is continuous, yeah, yeah. Uh, then the first cost doesn't make sense yeah, yeah. because it's not invariant on the repair because over there is a, there is an issue yeah but no the just, second cost on oh, the second one is fine it's fine okay so that second question is i guess these costs are important when you don't want the, the policy to go to a delta function to become very key okay now one would guess that for a large class of problems the optimal solution is are these singular um uh, uh, deterministic policy. Yeah. Now, can you say something about for what class of problem the, the, the optimal solution is not deterministic? And if for many problems the solution is deterministic, why don't we just start with the pie which is not stochastic, the policy which is deterministic? Look for the best deterministic policy. Yeah, I'm not fully aware of the component. I cannot give you a complete uh, answer to your question. Uh, but uh, under at least this setup uh, in Markov decision processes uh, that are only chain, so essentially that you that are close to, to transitions and you don't you don't have like a separated. Uh, in those cases, the the solution uh, is is unique and is deterministic, except for uh, breaking ties. That's the only thing. So I'm not aware, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you know. Yeah. So in MDP setting in the reinforcement learning, when your transient kernel and reward is fixed, then the optimal policy is deterministic. Yeah, exactly. But if you want a policy that, that will perform better when the transient kernel can be you know changed a little bit, it's robust to noise, then the deterministic policy and the optimal policy might be stochastic, depending upon the noise, kind of noise you have. So there are no deterministic policies that are robust to small changes in the transition matrix you're saying actually it depends on noise so there's kind of noise uh, for which uh, uh, optimal policy is deterministic and there's, there's a kind of noise for which it's not as rectangular and as that's technical okay so then yeah. a very element so very elementary screen the basics but if if we know to begin with uh, the optimal policy will be deterministic. Why do we write the problem in terms of stochastic policy? Because it, it because it's a speed, a speed up uh, learning. So uh, leaving our hands. So it has robustness to so generalize better, and because you explore in the process of learning more space, you are less prone to get the trap in a local minima. And then you explore better and you learn faster. But then shouldn't our objective function not be reward, but generalization and reward? You see, because yeah, because you're saying, okay, I want to maximize reward, but now I'll do something else because some other property is better. But then shouldn't I solve a bigger problem which includes generalization? Yeah, that would be like the ideal world scenario. Yeah, but that's very hard. Yeah, but that would be the way to. Um, Okay. I just want to comment that uh, in my talk, I will talk about the classes of problems which non deterministic uh, policy find the problem. So, Rava, what's your questions? Can you say it again? We, we cannot quite follow on our side. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was um, just asking Ruben to comment on when should the policy be. Uh, thought of as deterministic versus stochastic, in which cases one is optimal or the other, and how it relates to the objective. 
<laughs> and the answer was, well, there are several answers. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the answer is that in, in, a, in, a, in a large um, set of uh, problems, the Markov decision processes like this, uh, that are unichain, then the optimal policy is deterministic, except for breaking ties. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, okay. More comments, questions? Okay, if not, um, I think there's one question. I'm sorry. But just to make it a little bit less abstract for me, so how does the agent assign value to the policy? Because the rewards is just something coming from the environment. So it's not entirely clear for me how um, in this equation. So the reward is just comes and how is, how is the value assigned to the policy? Well, this is like an intrinsic motivation signal. Uh, this is now my interpretation of, uh, of what this uh, term is. So this is an intrinsic motivation signal. So where, let's assume that you, you have a policy that is deterministic, meaning that you choose only one specific action. Then this entropy goes down to, to zero. And therefore you don't have any intrinsic uh, reward for using a deterministic uh, policy. But, uh, but if you use a stochastic policy, and if, in particular, if you use a, an action whose probability is very low, it doesn't make sense, right? So you have your own policy that tells you, don't do that, that action, but now you're a teenager and you say, oh, okay, I'm going to do that, that action. That gives you a lot of reward because that's the logarithm of a, of a forbidden uh, action. And that, I mean, it goes to infinity. So this is it's not even bound, uh, bounded, the, the, the intrinsic reward that you will get in that, uh, in that trial. And that a priori could be problematic for the framework, but it is not actually, because it's weighted by the, by the probability itself uh, in the entropy. So the entropy is well defined, yeah. except in the continuous case. So this answer you, question about the intuition, it's like intrinsic reward. So you should think of it as intrinsic reward, which is totally different from the standard uh, uh, action state reward signal that shouldn't depend on the policy. So this reward depends on your policy. And now you change your policy, you, have, you get different rewards because you change your policy. Okay, so then I'm going to go to a little bit of math okay? uh, because I want to give you a trick about uh, how to solve uh, this Bellman equation. So how do you solve this Bellman equation? How do you find the optimal policy? And how do you find out the optimal state value function? I mean, unless you have that, uh, we cannot do much. Uh, yes, we are just talking about it. But the point is that we can solve this problem and we can get the, the math uh, done. So I'm going to do that. Will be a little bit shorter than before. Okay. So so now we have Bellman equation with this uh, regularization term that we would like to to optimize. Okay, let's write it in this way. Are you happy with this equation? This is the Bellman equation written in a specific uh, way where I put uh, out the, the, the sum over the, the actions, the probability of the actions, and everything else is within the bracket, including the, 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 the reward, the intrinsic reward, 
plus the future uh, state values weighted by the next state. So, so how do you optimize this? So typically when you want to optimize uh, equations like this, you take uh, derivatives, right? The only problem is that here, so this uh, function is V of P, is also a function of the policy. And actually you, you will need to take derivatives with respect to, the, to these quantities, to the policy probabilities for all actions and for all states. The other problem is that this is a, a, a constrained uh, optimization problem because the policies cannot be any quantity. They have to be positive and they have to sum up to one, okay? So uh, uh, visually, so what you have is something like this. So, so uh, for a particular state, you have the value function that depends on the, on the policy. Uh, that is a function that depends on, uh, you know, of all the probabilities of your policy. So here for two actions, I'm just plotting two axes, but this is a multi-dimensional axis with many axes for every action and a state that uh, you can have. And the value is a function that lives in this uh, space. And that's, uh, so it's going to be some surface. So somewhere over there, okay? So we can look at now this uh, function from the top, which is uh, more illustrative. So from the top, uh, what we have here is uh, this probability for that action, the probability for this other action, and we know that the, this probability they should live in a in a simplex, so that means that they have to the only probabilities that we're going to consider are these uh, these points over here that hit this axis at one and at one over there. So these are the set of probabilities that we want to consider. We don't want to consider the whole plane because uh, probabilities are constrained to sum up to to one. Okay, uh, and now how the the value function looks at from the top view. Well, we don't really know how this is, is looking up, is looking out, but uh, let's assume that it's looking something like this. So this is the maximum and has this shape more or less, and it's hitting uh, uh, the, the line over, over there. So what you can see is that at the, at the optimum, so the, at the position of P, the probabilities for which we're going to reach the optimum value of the policy, uh, what happens is that the gradient, the gradient of the value function is, uh, is independent of the action. So if I take the gradient of the value with respect to, to uh, this probability, this is some quantity that only depends on the state. Because this uh, gradient, this line has to be perpendicular to, to the line uh, of uh, minus one slope. So it has to have a unit slope, the gradient, right? Just by geometry, it has to, has to be that. Uh, so this is critical. But do you, do you see this point? Because it's kind of, a, it's, it's the only trick, but it's important to, that, that you see it. No, yeah. I have no idea what the... Okay, so let me uh, repeat this. So you are fine that uh, we need to, uh, uh, that the value function is on top of this plane, and it depends on these uh, pi's. But we can only consider pi's probabilities that lie in the simplex, okay? So if the value function has uh, the, the actual optimum over here, that's unattainable. We cannot reach that because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's outside the, the region of probabilities that we're considering, right? Uh, now, if we look at the, the equivalue uh, lines, Let's assume that they're like this. So this line means that the, now this line, this has a slower value than the center. This other line has a smaller value and so on. It, it doesn't need to go up, down all the time, but let's assume that it's going down. It's going down, it's going down, and eventually it's going to hit the, the line of constraints. And at that point, this is going to be the optimal value of the value function that we can attain. That point over there. And that point is going to be tangent. It's going to be a tangent. So this line is going to be a tangent to the equivalue uh, lines. And if it's tangent, then that means that the gradient, the gradient of the value function has to be pointing away from, uh, perfectly away, has to be orthogonal to the, to the simplex. Okay? And it's this condition. It should be independent of the action. 
So here, uh, the slope for action A and the slope uh, for action B has to be the same. So these two components, they have to be the same. It's pointing, it's pointing uh, parallel to the main diagonal, okay? So, so this is the only trick. And it's equivalent to using uh, Lagrange multipliers, but uh, I find this a little bit more intuitive why this should be the way. It can be inside, it can be on the, on the other side. Uh, uh, yeah, because if not, then you will have a component on the simplex and then you can move a little bit in that direction, you know? It has to be, it has to be orthogonal to the simplex or the maximum is on the simplex. That can also be the, the case, yeah. Exactly, so that's for the case where the maximum is outside yeah. the simplex. Yeah, yeah. but this is, yeah, if it's inside, then it's inside, and then uh, you will have exactly the same, yeah? Because this, these guys are going to be zero. In that case, uh, the gradient will be zero, yeah? So it holds for all the cases. Uh, so now uh, we go here to uh, the Bellman equation, and uh, we take uh, partial derivatives everywhere. So here on, on the first one, we get alpha uh, lambda uh, equal uh, uh, S. Then we take a derivative with respect to, so we're taking derivative, just to be super clear, with respect to P I S, A S, okay? First one, we get the, this, uh, this component over there. Then we hit this uh, pi over here in the sum. So the sum disappears and we get all the terms that show up uh, inside the bracket. Go ahead, I don't know if there is some questions there. Okay. Okay, and then uh, we take the derivative of the log that gives us uh, minus alpha because the derivative of the log is one over pi that will cancel out, uh, cancel out with the pi that is over here. So that gives us one minus alpha multiplied by one, if you want. And then, you have to take derivatives of uh, the value function that is in here, that is uh, on the future state. This is a little bit nasty, it looks nasty. So we have to take derivatives over there. But the cool thing is that by using the same argument, we know that this derivative shouldn't depend on the actions. By using exactly the same the argument, actually depends on S and S prime but it shouldn't depend on the, on the actions. And if it doesn't depend on the actions, um, I'm missing, sorry, I'm missing here. I'm missing here the sun over A's that they don't go away now because I'm, I'm making now the partial derivative, derivative inside the, the sun, okay? So it's inside the sun. I was missing that. So, so this doesn't depend on the actions. Then I can sum over actions and over, over, uh, over states and sum in over actions. So this whole thing doesn't depend on actions. It only depends on S because I'm summing up over S prime, sorry, over here. Yeah. Questions about uh, any of the steps? So we are pretty much done because um, actually what I wanted to solve is the problem with the regularizer, but it doesn't, change anything at all and just plug it away now. And uh, now we solve, we solve for pi. We solve for pi and we know that this is proportional to pi zero, exponential of uh, alpha minus one, rewards plus teacher expected values. So, so this is the optimal policy. So when you equate the value to the optimal value, then you can find the, the optimal policy. Okay. And what you can see is that this optimal policy is the soft max rule, right? So if you remember that this guy here in the bracket is the Q value, is the optimal Q value, this is simply a softmax uh, rule with, on top of that, the default policy that is waiting how much you should uh, pick up different actions. So this is the softmax rule that people have been using for a long time in psychology in a heuristic way. And it comes out naturally uh, from 
the soft RL framework as the outcome, optimal outcome of the behavior. Okay, so this is a very nice connection of the intuitions that psychologists have a long time ago with this piece of math that has emerged from, uh, from uh, RL. Okay, so now I'm going back uh, to, to the slides if you don't have any questions. So how much time do I have? So on the schedule, we have like, uh, we have five minutes. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, like, how much time? I can go like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Yeah. I can go a little bit faster because now it's examples and examples and examples. So uh, that still leaves us an hour and 15 minutes for lunch. That's okay, perfect. So thank you. As, as long as it's okay for the Beijing side. Is it okay for you guys in Beijing if we go on for 20 minutes? I guess it's okay. <laughs> don't say anything. <laughs> what's the question? What's your suggestion? Is it okay if we go on for 20 minutes? Judge Han. It was okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I I would do a compromise. How about ten minutes? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Totally perfect. Fair enough. So this yeah, is a we, summary. We are. Yeah. We're hungry. No, you are. Yeah, you have to go for dinner. Okay. Uh, this is optimal policy. You can insert this into the Bellman equation, and then you get a self consistent equation for the optimal uh, state value that can be uh, recurrently uh, solved. Okay, so um, okay, so a little bit of a detour uh, in physics. As many of us are physicists, let's go to with this very nice context. So now I'm going to present a few examples where they use the notion of entropy for different matters, not only for exploration, not only for regularization but also to explain interesting sort of behavior, okay? So this is a very beautiful paper that I recommend uh, by uh, Business Gross. And the idea is the following. The idea is that, uh, is that uh, you are a particular state in the world. And uh, in this particular state, you can perform many possible paths, many possible trajectories, okay? So, uh, and if you can perform many possible trajectories, this is great because you're free to move. So you like those states. You like those states where you can move a lot. But what happens when you're in a state like this one where there is a boundary on the right side. So essentially you can have paths that uh, pretty much everywhere, but they cannot enter this region. They cannot enter this region because of the environment uh, makes you impossible to go to that place or because of your dynamics, your body dynamics makes it impossible you to go to that direction, okay? Uh, then, uh, they define uh, what they call like a, like entropic force. The idea is that if this is the case, then there should be a force towards the left because if you move slightly a little bit towards the left, then you're going to have more paths to choose from because essentially you are moving away from the boundary that you may encounter in the future. So this is the idea that there are going to be forces that will push you in a specific direction where you will have a lot of flexibility to move in the future. Okay, so you can formalize this. I'm going to go super quick about this. Uh, essentially, this is formalized with the entropy. So this is the entropy of, uh, of a path integral, the, or, or all the possible paths. This is a quantity that you uh, that, that this agent likes to, to maximize. So you take the gradient and this is the force. So they, they're using all the language of physics. So everything is force, momentum, and these kind of things, but essentially we can interpret the force as an action. Uh, to move in a particular, to move to a, a, another state, okay? This is kind of Casimir forces, fluctuation induced forces. Right. Is it the same as Casimir forces? I don't know. I don't know. Because I forgot about Casimir forces, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but maybe it's, maybe it's related. Uh, and, uh, and they took, uh, well, they introduced the notion of microscopic forces and these microscopic forces is actually what is generating this uh, net force in a particular uh, direction. 
Okay, so with this uh, approach, uh, you can inter you can generate interesting behaviors like uh, like this one on the top left. What you have is a particle that is moving because of these entropic uh, forces, and not very surprisingly, this particle moves towards the center of the of the box because it's where it's going to have the highest uh, accessible entropy, the possibility of performing many actions, right? As compared as when the particle is on one corner, right? A uh, more interesting behavior is the one at, uh, at the bottom. This is an uh, inverted pole. This is a pole that uh, is free to move. It has these uh, intrinsic, intrinsic forces. And uh, what happens is that this system uh, goes up, uh, right uh, up, and it stays there for a lot, as uh, you can see over there. And this is, the, this is the case because this is the state with the highest possible entropy that you can have in the future because it's an unstable fixed point. And stable fixed points are great for that because you have access accessibility to many, many states with very little energy. Okay. And uh, uh, you can see like uh, the videos uh, in this uh, YouTube. Can you uh, show the movie for us? Uh, I think it would be more. No, you, you gave me 10 minutes, so I cannot show the video. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the video is there. You, you can check it out. <laughs> I won't show it. Uh, final state. One problem of this framework is that the final states, they have very little variability. So once the particle goes to the center of, of the pole, it's up, uh, right, uh, upright, stays there. So that, look, that doesn't look very realistic. Uh, it has more problems uh, about the uh, stability. I won't go there. But the, the main problem is that it's not, uh, it cannot be formalized as a, with a Bellman form, uh, formalism. So the idea here is that uh, this force this action that this entropic force that is uh, made at particular time doesn't know about the future entropic forces that can happen in the future. And the formalism doesn't have that. So there is no Bellman equation for this formalism. And therefore the, the formalism is a little bit, uh, it's very uh, fragile. It really depends on the horizon that you use that is totally arbitrary and so on. Uh, another uh, framework, uh, empowerment, which is also using the idea of entropy as something important to drive uh, behavior. Uh, so this is beautiful uh, thesis report by uh, June, but the main guy here is uh, Polanyi has been uh, pushing this uh, quite a lot uh, with collaborators, many collaborators. So the idea is that uh, you will need to be in a state where you are empowered, where you have uh, the maximum empowerment. What does it mean empowerment here? Empowerment uh, means, uh, so just to give you, so you are in initial state, an initial location. You have uh, future states that you can reach. And to reach those states, you perform sequence of actions. Okay, so there are two uh, random variables here. The final state, the sequence of actions. The empowerment is uh, maximum when the mutual information between the final states and your actions is maximized. So essentially you are in power of your situation. You know that you, you do a specific actions, you will reach to there. And you would like to be in situations where you are in power. So this is the definition of empowerment. And it's a kind of like interesting way of thinking about uh, behavior. Like uh, you would like to be in, uh, in locations where you can do a lot of stuff, but you are in full control of that stuff, okay? Uh, well, you can, uh, uh, I, I won't go over this. Uh, so how do you move? What are the actions here? So the actions are, so let's assume that you are in a particular state where you have a zone empowerment. And then you look at the nearby points, the nearby states, and you compute the, the empowerment of the nearby points. So essentially you will move to the closest point that this has a higher uh, empower, empowerment as compared to the current situation. If there is no such a point, then you stay there because it's the, the position with the highest empowerment. Uh, so that's the policy that uh, you can use. And uh, they're using a very nice set of uh, examples. And again, an example that this pretty much like, uh, is, this is called the Acrobot, is like a two, uh, uh, a pole with two, com two segments. And you can play this algorithm. And as you may expect, as in the previous case, the most empowered position is the one where you have the pole uh, upright with the two segments upright. Why? Because this is, this is again the most uh, empowered situation, right? Because this is the, the position where if you change a little bit, you're going to reach many, many other states. 
but you are in full control because it's a deterministic system. Right? So this is the, is the, even though it looks like a little bit weird because it's super unstable, but this is the most power situa situation. What is the problem? The problem again is that it generates very little behavior. So it generates, it reaches to a specific state and then it stays there. And then I would uh, like to talk uh, about, uh, about the framework that we have developed um, very briefly because I will continue um, the, the next day. And the idea is that, so let's take this like a, like a principle. Like uh, start to think about the, like a new principle of, uh, of behavior. And let's see how far we can go with this uh, principle. The idea is that rational agents, the interesting guys, are those that can occupy a space and be free to perform complex sequences of action. So here there is no notion of reward, as you can see. An intelligent guy, an intelligent animal is someone who can do this kind of thing. So let's take this as a principle. Uh, one of the main problems of this is how do we formalize this, uh, this principle? And uh, we need to talk about something about uh, what do we mean by a path? So what do we mean by, by uh, be free? And we need to uh, define uh, very importantly the concept of occupancy. What do we mean by occupying a space? Okay. And not very surprising that you may expect this is going to be highly related to the idea of entropy. So entropy is going to show up again as a, as a natural measure of, uh, of occupancy. And then I'm going to skip this because uh, this is what the Beijing group uh, led me to have. So I think it's, uh, it's 10 minutes that I enjoy. So okay. do you have any questions uh, about this? Yeah. So the last... Uh... Empowerment, I think that you introduced it's opposite of what now you're introducing in a sense, no? Because this is more occupancy that one is more determinism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's the complement, yeah. yeah, that's a good way to, to look at it, yeah. So essentially you want to have, you have to have, you want to have very little in power. As long as you can move a lot. Right? I mean, if you die because you're doing crazy things, then you don't move, so that you don't want to be too crazy. But you want to be, you know, explorative and energetic and, uh, yeah. And here by motion, I don't mean like physical motion. You can think also of uh, like uh, mental activity uh, or, or, or interacting with people. It doesn't need to be really like the physical motion. So the state can be very abstract and very, very, very large. Was enough math? Okay. Great, thank you thank so much. You. Okay.